it's a parametric oscillator. To get started, let's first discuss what a parametric oscillator is mathematically and its differences from a normal damped harmonic oscillator. A damped simple harmonic oscillator with no driving force can be modeled by a simple pendulum. We can find the equation of motion from the kinetic and potential energy of the system. The kinetic energy is defined by the motion of the bob along the arc length L theta. The potential energy is due only to gravity, which is m times g times the height above the equilibrium position of the bob at any given point, which is given by L times 1 minus cosine of theta. Now we can find the acceleration of the pendulum in terms of theta. By setting up a Lagrange equation, we can find the acceleration in theta. The force opposing the, the acceleration in theta is the damping force, which is negative beta, the damping coefficient, times L squared times theta dot. So we find our equation of acceleration. The first term in this equation is due to the force of gravity acting on the bob, and the second is from the damping force acting in the opposite direction of the bob's motion. We'll keep that in mind for later. Now we can talk about the parametric oscillator. Two common ways to make a parametric oscillator are by applying some vibration to the mass so that it oscillates, and by changing the length of the post that a pendulum bob is fixed to. We'll be dealing with the latter case. For this system, I'll define L as the initial length of the pendulum post and theta as the angle the pendulum is from rest, just like in the case of the damped harmonic oscillator. This time, however, we have another parameter, the changing length of the post. I'll call this x. I'm going to define the motion of x as the change in length of the post as that of a harmonic oscillator. Therefore, through some simple math, we can find the velocity and acceleration of x. We can do this because, by definition, a parametric oscillator is a system with one of its independent parameters being driven in a periodic manner. The kinetic energy of this system looks similar to the kinetic energy of the damped harmonic oscillator, but because this system has one more free parameter, there will be an extra term. The potential energy of this system is exactly the same as that of a damped harmonic oscillator because gravity is the only outside force acting on the system. Now we find the Lagrange equation of this system with respect to theta. We don't have to find the equation with respect to x because we are going to explicitly be defining what the motion of x is. Again, we set the Lagrange equation equal to the force in the theta direction, which is the same for the damped harmonic oscillator because the damping force is acting in the opposite direction of the theta motion as before. There is no damping of the motion in the x direction. Now that we have the full equation, we can solve for the acceleration in theta. To clean this up a bit, I'm making the substitution that beta divided by the mass of the bob is equal to alpha. Now let's compare this to the damped harmonic oscillator from earlier. It's obvious that the parametric oscillator has a more complicated motion, which is to be expected, as there is a driving force acting on the parametric oscillator while the damped harmonic oscillator is undriven. However, we can see some similarities. This first term here with the gravitational constant is the acceleration in the theta direction due to gravity. The alpha term here represents the damping force being applied to the system, and we can see that this is in the negative theta direction. This term here, however, does not appear in the damped harmonic oscillator equation. It's called the Coriolis term. A Coriolis term like this one appears in systems where one parameter is changing within the reference frame of a second parameter, which is also changing, meaning the post length of the pendulum is changing. So when we look at the bob from the reference frame of the post, the bob is still moving. Since the bob is moving within our reference frame and within the reference term of the post, the Coriolis acceleration term appears. Now that we've gone over the derivation of motion for a parametric oscillator, we can discuss what makes this system so interesting. As I mentioned before, the term parametric is used for any system where one of the independent parameters in the system is driven periodically. In this case, we are driving the system periodically by varying the length of the pendulum post as the sinusoidal function a times cosine of omega drive. Here we start the system from rest, where theta is zero. We can see that the bob is moving with the driving force, but it is not moving in the theta direction. Now here is the section where all of physics actually occurs. Because we know definitively the motion of the post, 
I've simply taken the derivative of the motion and used it to update both the velocity and the position of the post. Here is an equation that, looks sh that should look pretty familiar. It's the equation of motion we found previously. As you can see, I've used it to update both the velocity and the position of the pendulum. Now that you have an understanding of what the code is doing, we can get to why this is such an interesting case. First, I want to give you a little visual preview of what I'll be discussing. I'll set the driving frequency to twice the natural frequency, which is 2 times the square root of the gravitational constant over the average length of the post L, and we'll see what happens. If I set the driving frequency equal to some random number, the pendulum doesn't have motion anything like this. This is the really interesting part. When you drive a parametric system at twice its natural frequency, you end up with what's called parametric resonance. Physically, parametric resonance occurs when the system is driven at twice its natural frequency. So every time the pendulum bob reaches its largest value of theta in that particular swing, the post lengthens. When the pendulum bob returns to its equilibrium position, the post is shortened, which we can see if we slow down the simulation. This increase in amplitude we see happens because every time the post retreats as it approaches the equilibrium position, the driving force is adding energy to the system because the post is traveling in the same direction as the bob's current motion. The total energy is shown here in blue, which we can see is increasing. By extending the pendulum post at the largest value of theta, the driving force also acts in the direction of the bob's current motion, minimizing the amount of energy dissipated by cycle, which we can see here on the other side of the energy curve. As the system is being driven, the period of oscillation is fixed. The only parameter able to change due to this increased energy is the amplitude of oscillation. Driving the system at twice the natural frequency is special because it allows this process to occur every half cycle of the pendulum, meaning every time the pendulum bob reaches its greatest value of theta, and every time it returns to equilibrium. Looking at the graph of the energy of the system, with kinetic energy in green, potential energy in yellow, and the total energy in blue, helps us better understand how energy is added to the system. Letting the program run, we can see that the total energy of the system grows as time increases, along with the kinetic and potential energies. The increase in kinetic energy indicates where the pendulum bob is moving with its highest velocity, which would of course be at the higher amplitudes of oscillation, as the period of oscillation must remain constant. Slowing it down, we can clearly see that the total energy graph increases each time the pendulum bob swings past its equilibrium position, adding energy to the system. Similarly, we can see that as the bob swings out to its maximum value of theta, the total energy lost each cycle decreases, thereby retaining the energy put into the system when the pendulum swung in. Here we can see the energy added to the system in one cycle, and here we can see the energy uh, dissipated per cycle. We can see that the energy dissipated per cycle is much less than the energy added per cycle, which would explain this increasing energy curve. The next natural question to ask about this system is why the amplitude doesn't increase indefinitely. As we've seen, the oscillations reach a maximum amplitude and then die out before building up again. This is because for parametric resonance to occur, the system must be linear. When theta and the velocity of the pendulum bob reach high values, the system begins behaving as a nonlinear oscillator. This image gives a good visual for the conditions for parametric oscillation. The shaded areas show where parametric resonance can occur. The term alpha here represents the cutoff point where the system ceases to be a parametric oscillator in parametric resonance and becomes a nonlinear oscillator. As you can see, there are other regions where the system oscillates parametrically other than when the ratio of the natural frequency to the driving frequency is one half. I used the one half ratio case previously because while other regions produce parametric resonance, the one half ratio produces the most dramatic result. As the image shows, a range of values around the one half ratio should also produce parametric resonance. The one-half ratio produces the most dramatic change in amplitude and energy of the system because of when the energy is added to the system in the cycle of oscillation. The pendulum will parametrically resonate for any driving frequency of two times the natural frequency over n, where n is any integer 1 or greater. The one-half ratio is for the case where n equals 1.
In the case where n equals 3, energy is added into the system in such a way that the amplitude of oscillation does not grow as it did in the case of n equals 1. Instead, the driving force both adds and takes away energy each cycle, instead of just adding energy. Because of this, the amplitude of the swings of the pendulum do increase with time, but within a much more constrained boundary than n equals 1. As you can see, the driving force is adding energy to the system near the top of the pattern. However, we can also see that this system is not getting the large amplitude resonance of the n equals 1 case. If we take a look side by side at the case where n equals 1 and 3, we can see that while the n equals 1 case is adding energy to the system every half period, meaning every time the pendulum swings to the equilibrium position, energy is added, and when it swings out, there is a minimal dissipation of energy. We see that in the n equals 3 case, the driving force is attempting to add energy three times a cycle. Driving force is putting energy into the system when the pendulum swings out to its greatest value of theta, as well as near the equilibrium position. This means at the greatest values of theta, the driving force is acting against the motion of the pendulum. This means that some of the energy added is being used to change the direction of the pendulum's motion. The rest of the energy goes to increasing the amplitude of the system. The driving force is also adding energy to the system near the equilibrium position, but because the force is acting with the motion of the pendulum bob, there is little energy dissipation due to, the changing of, due to changing the direction of motion. We can see this pattern is repeated when n equals 4. The driving force is adding energy to the system four times per cycle, producing this pattern. This pattern continues for every n. This shows that the only value of n that produces extreme amplitudes during parametric resonance is n equals 1.